Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your, our Savior Jesus Christ to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Amen. At this time, the children are invited to come forward and go downstairs for children's worship. From Acts. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At, the ver at that very moment, three men, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angels standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa, and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. Thank you.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At the Last Supper, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Epworth Methodist Church, Matamoris, Pennsylvania, 1961, a Sunday. I'm four years old. Down the hallway, I see my dad in his clerical vestments scolding an elderly woman, at least elderly to a four-year-old, who is backed up against a wall crying. This is the only time in my 64 years that I remember at least seeing my father scolding anybody publicly. I'd learn later that my dad was scolding the kindergarten Sunday school teacher for telling her class that if they disobeyed their parents, they would go to hell. My dad saw this as abusive and contrary to the message of Christ's love that he felt called to preach, especially to children. Story number two. When I was 15, my friend Johnny had a born-again conversion experience that for a few years took all the fun out of him. The next day, he made clear to our coterie of friends that he would devote all of his spare time to Bible study and repentance in preparation for Jesus' imminent return. He quickly came down with stomach trouble and other stress-related symptoms, which he dismissed as Satan's attempt to divert his attention from his devotions. A A few weeks later, we convinced Johnny to go with us to see the Poseidon Adventure. Although the reborn Johnny had forsworn any entertainment that was not biblically sound, he gave in. At some points in the film, there are flashes of ladies' underwear, modest flashes to be sure. The Sears catalog was far more salacious. But this so upset Johnny that he finally got up long before the end of the movie and said loudly, this film is gross, I'm going home. And he did, while we stayed until the end no more hellbound than we would have been before seeing the movie. Years later, a more moderate Johnny, still faithful, laughed about those early days of profound scrupulosity, and he confessed the change for the better when his girlfriend and he struck off to the empty band room of the Bible college they attended to steal a kiss. Had they been found out, they would have been expelled. They're approaching their 43rd wedding anniversary, and feel no remorse for their collegiate indiscretion. And I'll just bet Jesus isn't upset with them either. Let's see here. Sorry, I think I'm missing a page of my sermon. So I'm, I'm um, going to just tell you one more story. This other story it's happened much more recently. We used to have a Wednesday service Uh, uh, before COVID and one Wednesday a newcomer to Old St. Paul's and a a one-time comer lingered after the service was over and asked me to hear their confession this person was overwrought really upset crying and convinced that this person had done something terrible but when the person explained to me 
what this wrongdoing was supposed to have been, I didn't think it was a sin. Now, as you might imagine, it's very rare for us to hear a confession individually in the Episcopal Church, so this was my first time. So I quick grabbed the Book of Common Prayer, turned to the right page, hoping that that would give me all the guidance I needed. Meanwhile, this poor person was just continuously overwrought, begging for forgiveness. I decided that the most charitable thing to do at that point was to offer absolution rather than engage this person in a theological discussion of what is sin and what isn't. Well, it seemed to have done the job. You know, I said to this person um, after the absolution, how do you feel? And the person said, oh, I feel so relieved. And I asked uh, whether this person felt like this would ever happen again. Is it absolutely not? I thought, all right, well, that's probably as good as can be done. To this day, I'm not sure that was the right move, but I tried my best. Now, all three of these stories have something in common, besides the fact that they're points on my lifeline. All three of them suggest a certain degree of scrupulosity. Now, scrupulosity is not Christian ethics. It's actually a psychological disorder. In fact, one representative definition reads, Quote, scrupulosity or religious obsessive compulsive disorder is a debilitating concern with morality far beyond what should normally come from a loving God. In effect, it creates a false idol out of one's own shortcomings. Evidence that such views are mistaken comes to us in today's reading from Acts and from the Gospel. In Acts we read, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. In John we read, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. St. Augustine argued that since God is supremely good, everything God created or creates must be good. To sin is to turn our backs on God and let something else substitute for God in our attention or devotion. Something else such as the kinds of things that might cause us to sin, but also a preoccupation with our own shortcomings. Thus, for example, food isn't evil, but gluttony is because it makes a false idol out of food. Romantic love isn't evil, but lust is because it makes a false idol out of its object. Money isn't bad, but greed is because it makes a false idol out of money, and so on through the remaining seven deadly sins. Additionally, having scruples isn't bad, but making a false idol of them, that is scrupulosity, is. The challenge here is for us to distinguish between enjoyment of God's creation and idolizing it. We should also be careful not to ascribe to God what God has not created. God did not create hate. God did not create bigotry. God did not create genocide. God did not create the overscrupulous or its opposite, the libertine. But rather than spend more time now trying to distinguish the true good from the true evil in the hope of never profaning what God has made clean, let's turn to the other imperative in today's reading love each other. Now, this might strike some of you as old news, and indeed it is. One Sunday, pre-COVID, one of our congregants, I think she was about 10 years old at the time, asked me whether the message every Sunday was love God and love your neighbor as yourself. When I answered that that was the weekly message in a nutshell, she asked me and her mom at the same time, then why do we have to keep coming to church? <laughs> My answer was that I need the constant reminder. Now, if she were an adult, I would have invited her to look around and tell me whether she thinks folks have gotten the message. By the end of a hectic week, I may not be living the message myself. A stupid driver, a politically obnoxious comment, or just the responsibilities that come with a middle-class life can get me off track really quickly. And I have to admit, sometimes I have to fight off scrupulosity as I, as I obsess over my failure to respond adequately to those poor souls standing at intersections holding cardboard signs asking for help. 
But as First Peter reminds us, love covers a multitude of sins. If you're busy loving your neighbor, or at least making the attempt, and here I mean love in the sense of the Greek word agape, then you're too busy to sin. Agape is the love that God has for us and that God requires us to have for each other. It recognizes each person as perfectly precious and filled with the dignity of the image of God. Let every moral inquiry include the question, have I acted lovingly toward my neighbor? How kind of Jesus to reduce the 613 commandments of the Old Testament, including the famous 10, to one, love your neighbor. Indeed, Romans, Galatians, James remind us that if you love your neighbor, you have all the commandments. And how kind of Jesus to show us how. In sum, neither a child's disobedience, nor watching the Poseidon adventure, nor a non-sin, a non-sin, is a ticket to hell. But rather than obsess on what, if anything, might be a ticket to hell, just love your neighbor. What could be simpler than that? And for those of you who continue to struggle with it, please join me next week in church where we'll give it another go. Amen. Let us offer our prayers to God for this community of faith that we may grow in unity and love for one another. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Eugene and Robert, our bishops, for all priests and the deacons, and for all the holy people of God. For the city of Baltimore, for this country, and for all the nations, that we may build together a world of justice and peace. For all those in danger and need, the sick, the suffering, and the hungry. For strength and faith for ourselves, our families, and those we love. At this time, I invite your other prayers, either silently or loud. Blessed are you, O God, who continues to bring new life. Hear our prayers and transform our lives through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Welcome to visitors and guests this morning. Uh, Mary, why don't you describe what happened after church today? Well, after two and a half plus years of not being able to have traditional Sunday school and a traditional forum, today we're actually going to have an education hour after the service. And so as soon as this worship concludes, the adults are invited to go back stairs and or back uh, the room and get a cup of coffee and a donut hole and then gather in the front pews because Mark Stanley will be leading a forum right here in the church. Following the service, parents with children and youth are invited to immediately go downstairs to the undercroft to be part of the opening ritual, just to sing a song, and then the Sunday school and the youth group will go off to their individual rooms. Um, this is a big deal to have these programs again, and we're so excited and so grateful. So please join us for what I hope is a rich time together. And just a, a pitch for the presentation I'm going to make. We're going to be talking about what makes a healthy and vibrant community, and every one of us has a role in that. And so please come and share your reflections as I share some different stories about churches. 
again, right after church, grab a cup of coffee and come forward. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. stars at night. All you make is very good. For the universe, we praise you. We worship and adore you. We give you thanks for our creator and our calling, for friendship and community, for love and laughter, tears and pain of growth. For your gift of life, we praise you. We worship and adore you. With all who stand before you in heaven and earth, from every culture, land, and tongue, we praise you. children shall be free. For your gift of Christ, we praise you. We worship and adore you. The 
the night before he died, Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. For new life in Christ, we praise you. We worship and adore you. Loving God, send your Holy Spirit upon us and our celebration that we may be fed with the body and blood of Christ and be filled with your life and goodness. Strengthen us to do your work and to be your body in the world. Unite us in Christ and give us your peace. For the peace of Christ, we praise you. We worship and adore you. Through Christ, our Redeemer, in the power of the Spirit, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessings and honor and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. of God.
Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father who created us in love, the Son who restores us by love, and the Holy Spirit who pours love into our hearts be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.